Ladies and gentlemen, I'm uh, Murray McLean, uh, Chair of the Australia-Japan Foundation, and it, uh, just saying that because we are a sponsor and support have supported the Japan Update since its inception uh, several or a number of years ago now, and uh, I must say that uh, the Japan Updates are a very key part of uh, our reason to exist because we like to support uh, dynamic activities that uh, help foster understanding and uh, knowledge between Australia and Japan and uh, the Japan Update does that brilliantly. So thank you very much for once again inviting uh, me to your conference. It's a great pleasure today for me to introduce uh, as a political keynote speaker, Professor Fujiwara Kiichi, who's a professor of international politics and director of the Institute for Future Initiatives at the <coughs> University of Tokyo. He has many, many hats, as uh, we were discussing over lunch. Um, he obviously has excellent English, having studied in uh, the United States as a Fulbright Scholar at Yale, and he's spent a great deal of time uh, at various universities, but also as an author, a, a highly published author, of um, a number of works relating to geopolitics and uh, our regional and global interests. Um, he writes a weekly film review for the Mainichi, which he tells me is really, <laughs> is really what he does most of the time, is sit around watching films to review. Um, I'm sure that's a very modest disclaimer because he is clearly also extremely well known as a highly stimulating and authoritative uh, commentator on Japanese politics, Japanese foreign policy, strategic issues, and we look, I look forward very much to uh, hearing from him today, not just in this keynote speech, but also as part of the panel that will follow this. So please join me in welcoming the Professor Kuzi. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador McLean, for your kind words, uh, which is a bit too generous, I should say. And uh, thank you very much indeed for inviting me to the 2019 Japan Update. Um, I always treasure opportunities to visit Australia. Um, first, of course, uh, because there's a great number of excellent scholars and practitioners uh, in Canberra. Um, and, and more importantly, should I say, um, that this is a hub, a place where, well, scholars from very different regions, um, sometimes with very different views to each other, can be engaged in constructive um, discussion. And I recall um, my visit in 2004 when we had the extremely uh, difficult relationship between Japan and, and China. Uh, related um, to um, history issue, Japanese uh, wartime responsibility, and the Yasukuni Shrine. And um, uh, well, there was many meetings uh, that I had attended in Tokyo, or for that matter, Washington. But the one I had here with Chinese, Korean, American, and Australian scholars was the best. Really, um, and somehow, you know, uh, in Australia, uh, we can be friends, um, <laughs> and, and that uh, must have something to do with this um, attention to multilateralism in uh, in a very sincere way, and not as a political token. So, um, I shouldn't take too much time thanking Australia, uh, but thank you very much indeed for inviting me to this meeting. Now, we have a puzzle here. Prime Minister Abe is about to become the longest standing prime minister in Japanese history. He's, well, um, it's not that long, really, compared to other nations. Uh, 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 but I should say that Australia has become more democratic than we are. <laughs> uh, we, 
we took pride in choosing one prime minister each year. <laughs> Um, um, but then that is not the case right now. And Abe is the strongest prime minister since Koizumi or Nakasone, not only in Kenya, but also on his gra uh, grasp, uh, grip over the executive, and also on his control over the parliament. I'm not praising him, it's just a statement of fact. And at the same time, at the same time, um, Prime Minister Abe has not been so successful as it might seem when it comes to foreign policy. Uh, take a look at his uh, record of his attempted negotiation uh, with Russia over the, well, um, a new treaty and that would restore um, Japanese sovereignty to what the Japanese call uh, Hokko Ryodo, uh, or the Korea Islands, and um, the, is the, um, the repeated <laughs> negotiations that, uh, both at the foreign minister level uh, and also at um, the level of, uh, well, Vladimir Putin and Abe Shinzo, and they met several, several times, um, it came out with nothing, really. We do not see any results at all. Uh, you take a look at um, Japan's relationship with the United States, and this is something I'll be discussing uh, later on. Uh, but right now, uh, an even more important issue is this um, conflict with ROK, um, the South Korean government. Um, this I would not discuss here, although um, this would be a topic down there, I believe. Um, and I don't really understand um, what's going on. Uh, but what it, what, shows, uh, what it shows is that the foreign, foreign policy making mechanism in Japan has changed quite abruptly. This is something I'll come back at the later part of my talk um, in the issue of Kante Gaiko. So the puzzle here is that you have a very strong prime minister, a very strong administration, in fact, possibly the strongest in the post-war years, and, not, and he has been surviving um, um, failures, if I may, in foreign policy. So this is a puzzle to me. And uh, um, Abe bashing is an intellectual's, um, um, well, habit in some ways, uh, but that's not the purpose here. I want to understand, and I want to think with you. Now, the topic here is, well, embracing Trump. Um, this is a pretty strong choice of words. But, but as a matter of fact, um, Mr. Abe has been embracing uh, Mr. Trump. Uh, just take a look at the series of summits. There has been many summits, uh, but even before Mr. Trump became the um, President of the United States, um, Prime Minister Abe visited New York, um, exchanged gifts, um, golf-related gifts, um, and that um, most certainly developed a personal relationship. And then, um, on, on January, that's only two months after the New York meeting, and, and Abe was invited uh, to Malalago, the Florida house, and down um, where they played, um, they played two rounds of golf. Um, and that gave a sort of a platform for, uh, that was a preview for things to come. Um, the, the G7 summit uh, in 2000, uh, 2017 was a glorious moment for Abe because, well, in essence, Trump was isolated. Uh, you have Trump here and you have others. Now, the only person who could talk to both was Prime Minister Abe. So th this was a fantastic moment for the Japanese Prime Minister working as a linchpin that brings um, European Union nations to, uh, together with the United States. And then uh, you see a whole series of summits, um, uh, three, Jap three summits in a year in 2018. That's a, that's a record, really. And then in uh, and, uh, uh, and 2019, this year, May, um, uh, Mr. Trump visits, uh, visited Japan and, uh, well, uh, watched sumo um, in, a, in a very serious matter. And he, he brought a chair um, to the Kokugikan, this small tournament or auditorium. It's not supposed to be done, but of course, it's being Mr. Trump, he could do that. And then Trump attends G20 Osaka summit. 
Um, this is one of the strongest personal connection between the, the Japanese Prime Minister and, um, and the President of the United States. Just take a look at the origin of embrace, and it's quite obvious. Um, the, Japanese foreign policy always paid attention to our relationship with the United States. U.S.-Japan relations is a par of paramount importance and of, uh, uh, for Japan. Uh, when it comes to policy matters, you have alliance and you have trade. Uh, on alliance, we depend on U.S. capabilities. So for, for obvious reason, a stable relationship between the U.S. and Japan is critical. Uh, when it comes to trade, um, and again, um, U.S.-Japan uh, relationship has always been uh, rocked by trade disputes. So managing a good and stable institutional framework um, that support bilateral trade, if not multilateral trade, is essential. So trade alliance um, makes U.S. obviously important to Japan. Not only that, U.S. president works as a political asset. A prime minister who has strong ties with the United States U.S. president has an extreme uh, influence in Japanese politics, for the simple reason being that he has the backing uh, of the U.S. government. Um, you can take a look at, um, say, for example, um, um, Prime Minister Nakasone, who used um, his relationship with um, President Reagan to a maximum degree. Uh, he had a personal tie with um, President Reagan, and that worked to his benefit. Or, Nakasone, uh, or um, Koizumi. Um, Koizumi also uh, was successful in building a strong relationship with um, President Bush, and, and that worked as a political asset for Prime Minister Koizumi. So personal confidence here is, uh, uh, goes um, um, uh, a long way. Another factor is that Trump, um, President Trump is totally unpredictable. Um, he's a newcomer, and he had a little connection to formal uh, diplomatic networks. So, well, how can you work with Mr. Trump? The first thing that Abe did was to embrace Trump, develop personal relationship, and uh, develop an asset that can work to his benefit. So far, so good. It's quite understandable. Um, and this was also a preemptive embrace. Uh, there was a fear that um, President Trump, the newcomer, might be um, tough on Japan, both in trade and alliance. There was a fear that Trump might, um, well, rock the alliance between U.S. and Japan, demand higher um, on host nation support. Um, when it comes to trade, um, Trump not only criticized China, but also criticized Japan that Japan is a free rider um, of trade. I think he was working on, a, on an image of the 1970s, and, and it gives me some sad um, uh, satisfaction to see um, a U.S. president praising Japan as if it is a major economic power. Uh, but nonetheless, um, uh, uh, um, so, well, um, Trump can go um, um, in many directions, unpredictable, so, um, so to prevent um, stronger reaction against Japanese policy, embracing Trump became a necessity. And there was another issue, of course, and that is China. Basically, there are three rivalries of China uh, between, between uh, Japan and um, China. Uh, one, of course, is territorial disputes um, and maritime safety. Um, uh, it's quite obvious, so I don't really think I have to um, inform you about that, but there is a territorial dispute um, in Senkaku Jayodai, and um, Chinese naval powers have been pretty active in the, um, in the neighborhood, uh, which alarmed the Japanese, of course. And in a more general sense, there was this attention to geopolitical rivalries, for China is not only expanding in an East or South China Sea, and China is now a major military power that has uh, moved um, out of, uh, to the blue waters. Um, so um, one belt, one road um, could be um, interpreted in geopolitical terms. Uh, how can we cope with a rising power that is China um, that was a major concern. I should also add an economic, economic rivalry. 
Uh, one thing that, well, I think I'll have time to discuss about later on, is that we see a revival of what I have called economic diplomacy in Japan. Uh, in more cruel terms, it was called checkbook diplomacy, using, o using um, um, an ODAs, official development dates, as a key tool uh, for Japanese foreign policy. Now, this is a policy that has become, well, um, strongly recognized in late 1970s to 1980s, all throughout 1990s, I should say. Uh, but uh, somehow um, went away, partially because of Japanese economic demise. And uh, the other reason being that Japan um, 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 accommodated um, uh, global standards on development days and, um, and stopped using um, checks for political purposes. This has changed. Uh, take a look at, uh, at the recent uh, international conference, development conference on Africa uh, that took place late August in Yokohama. Um, Abe, of course, delivered a speech. Uh, this was a key, important moment for Japanese policy. But what, why Africa? Well, one reason would be to win, uh, win uh, Japan, uh, win support for uh, nominating Japan for the standing member of the Security Council. That's a long shot, to say the least, but that was, of course, there. A more important reason is China. China's economic influence um, in Africa alarmed the Abe administration, and suddenly Africa became important. I'm only talking about Africa. And, uh, there's quite a, a bit of things that I can discuss here, but we can um, argue that we see a revival of economic diplomacy that we had observed up until the end of the Obuchi cabinet, Obuchi administration. So it's been quite some time. And that's because of China. Now, Abe administration has been quite assertive in putting Japan back on the chessboard. Um, the idea was that China is a rising power and Japan is neglected, Japan is being passed over. So putting Japan um, back in the regional chessboard became so important. To do that, um, Japan not only approached the United States, but also ASEAN, Australia, um, as key partners. Um, Abe has visited all ASEAN nations twice. Um, never happened before. Um, this key attention to Southeast Asia is something that we have not observed for more than 30 years, more than 30 years. Um, and that is, of course, because of China. And Australia is a key um, partner in this um, regard. Um, and um, uh, it also served a domestic purpose. Well, this was about making Japan great again. Um, to restore confidence in Japan, I hope it's not unilateralism like uh, Mr. Trump, but Mr. Abe's um, keen attention to put Japan back on the global chessboard uh, had a domestic um, importance as well. And then, and I should rush here, this leads to a hope for a tougher America. Um, I'll be very quick here, but there was disappointment or dismay about Obama administration's approach to uh, China. Uh, there was an, an, an frustration about the engagement policy, uh, which essentially allowed China to become um, much stronger and much more of a challenger in the region. And, and also, uh, the other point is that um, uh, the geopolitical uh, aspect of Obama administration's policy was quite um, volatile. Uh, the air-sea um, um, battle idea um, did not really come out with a coherent strategy, and that invited frustration from Tokyo. Now, so Tokyo doesn't want to fight China. In fact, Tokyo cannot fight China. What Tokyo wants is a tough US to push China away somehow. And then that led to uh, what I consider to be um, a, 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 a mistaken um, um, uh, expectation um, of President Trump. Uh, President Trump might be unpredictable. In fact, he might be, uh, he might be an only, um, a, a, only um, a, a newcomer to foreign policy. But so long as he's tough against China, well, isn't that a great chance for Japan? 
the um, the uh, the initial um, um, two years um, uh, um, uh, uh, was all spent on, on mobilizing U.S. Um, um, influence over China uh, for Japan's political interests, and I'll, uh, I'll, um, I'll uh, tell you later on that that has ch changed over time. Um, in 2018, there was a summit meeting in October. And in the in 2018 summit with Xi Jinping and Abe Shinzo, oh boy, something totally different took place. We see a new rapprochement between Beijing and, and Tokyo. Well, how is that? Um, coming back to um, this, um, this um, um, mistaken uh, focus on, on Trump as a, tough, uh, a tougher US against China, the embrace did not really work. We have to admit that there is a strong personal tie between the two leaders. I'm just going to skip the details because it's too juicy. Um, however, when it comes to policy consequences, it does not really work. And when it comes to trade, um, the Trump administration has been tough to both China and Japan. And also, when it comes to um, alliance management, um, a good personal relationship with President Trump did not bring about a more nuanced view um, on host nation support. In fact, the opposite is the case. Um, uh, we believe that uh, U.S. demands for host nation support uh, is much higher than uh, has been ex uh, and accepted. Um, the originally it was supposed to be um, twice as much, um, but there are reports that Washington is asking to, um, to Japan to pay four times more. Um, um, that's a ridiculous figure, and we're not taking this seriously. Uh, but nonetheless, when it comes to uh, the Trump administration, you have to take everything seriously. <laughs> and furthermore, when it comes to China, um, there is a different policy preference. Japan is more afraid about China as a military power. Japan also is afraid about China as an economic power, to be sure, but to push China by economic means can disrupt the global market. On the other hand, the Trump administration has focused on the economy first and geopolitics second. In fact, I, it will not be too much to say that um, the military uh, strategy um, from the Trump administration toward um, 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 China has been actually um, less consistent um, even compared to the Obama administration. In the Obama administration, there was a strong uh, focus on geopolitics which is not the case right now. The focus is on trade. So that led to the um, confusion that we see. Now, I'm really running out of time, so I have to skip um, a couple of slides. U.S.-China trade wars. Um, right now, we are working in this direction. We were in a stalemate. Um, a temporary halt um, to tariff war could be expected, but the threat of retaliatory tariff will continue. Um, but geop oops, um, geopolitics and trade would be relatively independent. That was where we were. That was a probable scenario. The great scenario, the agreement, uh, comprehensive agreement, including um, structural adjustment, is not going to happen anyway. We're moving into this direction, a stalemate to a new Cold War. I do not want to use the word Cold War yet. Um, and if we want to apply the word Cold War, this is more closer to the period before the Korean War, uh, 1949 to 1950, uh, where the strategic situation was much more volatile um, between uh, the Soviet Union and the United States. It's not the Cold War yet. However, we are moving in this direction. And that led to the October summit. It, this was essentially about risk management. Um, this was uh, how Japan and China could somehow hedge the risk that comes from the trade um, policy from the Trump administration. 
and that much has been uh, reported quite widely. But I should also add that um, this was the first time that we see um, a co collaboration on defense policy between China and Japan, which we have not seen for quite some time. Um, we, see, we, we now have um, an air-sea communication mechanism, a search and rescue agreement, uh, and, and of course we have high-level uh, defense talks, defense dialogues as well. This is a meeting where the expectation was high on the Tokyo side, but not on the Chinese side. And after the meeting, uh, Prime Minister Abe um, stated that the two nations agreed on three principles, three, from competition to cooperation, partners, not threats, development of free and just trade regime. Apparently, these three principles were prepared uh, by the, by the um, Japanese cabinet, but was not agreed with the Chinese government. So um, the statement was quickly withdrawn. Um, just to make sure, the prime minister said this in a press conference, and that uh, we now agree on three principles, and then that was taken away. Doesn't happen like this. Uh, Japanese diplomacy is such a boring place, um, so predictable. All the papers come out before the meetings. <laughs> The four bullet points on, of the Xi Jinping um, Abe summit uh, before was available to the press before that meeting, uh, which actually invited anger uh, from Beijing. It's just the opposite side. How did this happen? I would say that this is related to um, a, a new kind of diplomacy that is taking place in Japan, and that is Kante Gaiku. I only have two minutes, so I have to be very brief. Uh, this essentially is a top-down approach in, uh, in diplomacy. Um, the role of the prime minister in foreign policy was extremely limited. Um, the actor in uh, foreign policy making was essentially the Minister of Foreign Affairs with little initiative coming from the Prime Minister. This has changed almost totally. Uh, policy making under the Abe administration, we have the Cabinet Bureau of Personal Affairs newly um, installed, which actually means that the Cabinet Secretariat would be in a position to choose key leaders in each ministries. And I cannot tell you how important this is to destroy the integrity of individual ministries. For the simple reason being that now the bureaucrats have to um, watch what uh, Kante or the cabinet office wants to do, or they might be sacked. And furthermore, uh, you see uh, the National Security Council under uh, Yachi Shotaro and Yachi along with Kanehara and is now the key architects of Japanese foreign policy, but not the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And then there is another issue, the Prime Secretary, uh, Hishokan, as it's called. Uh, when it comes to Hishokan, the um, inner clique of the Abe administration, we see a strong influence from METI, Ministry of External Trade and Industry. Uh, you might have heard about uh, Imai Takaya, who is very possibly the second most important person in Japanese politics today, uh, because uh, Imai Takaya is the one who's running the show, really. And he is not only from METI, he has openly stated to the press that foreign policy coming from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs is obsolete. <laughs> um, whoops, um, but that is what he said. Um, there are limits to Kante diplomacy. Um, well, there are merits, of course, and the to this top-down approach brings more integrity and more leadership for Japanese foreign policy. It puts a face on the Japanese government, and that's good. It also allows for flexibility. If there's anything about uh, Japanese foreign policy, it is always inflexible. Uh, but when it comes uh, with a strong leadership from the prime minister, you can change policy quite abruptly. And that's what we saw in the change um, of um, um, policy toward China uh, from uh, 2016 to 2018 especially. But there are limits. Um, one is demise of professionalism. 
Um, with all my disrespect for Ministry of Foreign Affairs, where many of my former students work, it's a, <laughs> that's why they fail, right? Um, uh, um, um, they're professionals. They do have good information about foreign relations. They also have information about how the other side works. Um, this is something that is conspicuously, conspicuously absent in Abe administration's approach to Russia and Abe administration's approach to South Korea. It is, work, it is working on the wishful thinking that the strong leadership from the prime minister would break the barrier uh, and, and um, achieve uh, great achievements. Russia, this was essentially about money, about, well, not ODAs, about investment. Uh, when it comes to South Korea, um, um, money in the reverse case, uh, uh, in the opposite direction. Um, you give money to Russia and you buy back the islands, essentially. Um, you, you disagree with South Korea and then use the economy. Um, the focus is on economic uh, diplomacy uh, or the lack of it. But this is not a professional approach to uh, foreign policy. For um, many of the Russian experts' voices or South Korean experts' voices has been silenced in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So that leads to a string of policy failures, if I may, Japan-Russia relations, trade negotiation with the US, and Mr. Trump being treated with a small tournament, and all the hospitality had the nerve, excuse my language, uh, to argue about um, increasing um, tariff on Japan. Um, and Abe's initiative on Iran is so painful that I don't really want to talk about. Uh, uh, but I'm not laughing about this, um, really, because uh, um, there was um, a serious, um, contest, uh, uh, serious conflict between um, Iran and the United States, um, and um, Tokyo working um, in between is not a wrong policy at all. Uh, what is wrong was that it lacked all the procedures, all the negotiations with, with, with Iran, all the negotiations with the United States. The professionals were kept out, the cabinet secretaries were in, and well, that's where we are. I'm over 33 minutes, I'm very sorry. Um, now, um, the nice thing about the keynote speech is that we have a panel discussion later on, so I, I'm only leaving this uh, podium uh, by addressing key questions instead of answering them. One, do we see a stable alliance or do we see decoupling? The, um, the possibility of decoupling um, is very much there with U.S. unilateralism and also U.S. and global retreat. But it's not clear yet. This is not yet the stage like um, um, President Nixon's uh, statement in Guam, which essentially was about um, pulling out U.S. influence from the Asian region. Uh, we haven't reached that stage yet. We might. This would be an important issue. Uh, future of Japan, PRC rapprochement. Uh, the 2018 summit went well. Uh, but nonetheless, um, can this kind of relationship be sustained between China and uh, Japan? I, I find it highly doubtful um, because there is really no um, institutional basis for the agreement. It's an, just a collection of ad hoc agreements. Will Kante diplomacy survive after Abe? After all, is this not only a, uh, is, is, is this not just a case of a long-standing prime minister with a long tenure, Nakasone, Koizumi, Abe? You stay long in office and you have a stronger Kante. That may be so, but like I said, there are also institutional changes that took place in Japan. So whether this Kante Gaiko, Kante diplomacy can be sustained um, is an open question. And um, I'm not only asking the fourth question um, because, um, uh, because um, um, uh, Professor Peter Drysdale is here. Um, does multilateralism have a future? I don't want to be cynical about this because I do believe that we do need multilateralism. 
But nonetheless, I would be foolish to deny that multilateral institutions uh, have become endangered species. So we have to address that question. And the final question is, which is more dangerous, US or China? Uh, Abe administration started from the assumption that China is more, more dangerous than the United States, and have come to realize that the United States can be as unpredictable and as challenging as China. Um, so, well, that, um, 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 so that decision is still yet to be made, um, but that's the milieu that um, we find ourselves um, today in Japan. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. I think everyone probably wanted you to keep talking for another hour. Ah. <laughs> no, well, I, I left out Korea and done. Um, okay, thanks. Yes. <laughs> Got to come over. A special favour to Lauren. <laughs> um, well, well, welcome everyone to the politics and, and foreign policy panel. I think you probably, most of you already know who is sitting here in front of you. We have Professor Pamendra Jain uh, from the University of Adelaide. We have Lauren Richardson from our very own ANU. We have Rumi Aoyama-san from Waseda. And of course, our keynote speaker. And I hail from across the Malabar, <laughs> uh, Perth at Murdoch University. Let's get started. We're not going to dive into CVs. We're going to dive into policy and politics. And we might be here till midnight because it's really interesting stuff. I'd like to start with a couple of observations. You know, the theme of our conference here today is about leadership in an age of uncertainty. And I, I think that's great. You read it everywhere, um, it rolls off the tongue. A few people uh, seem to have a problem with it, except last week when I met Malcolm Cook. Um, in Singapore, and he said, I'm tired of hearing this talk about uncertainty. <laughs> um, we are becoming more and more certain every day, she said, verbally, Malcolm, about how China is going to behave mm -hmm. and what we may or may not expect from the United States. We have more certainty about what that looks like than arguably we had uh, before the advent of the Trump administration, um, arguably uh, before 2016, if we're talking about um, China in particular. So we might play with that idea. Recently, Peter Varghais, in a speech referred to the liberal international order as being on life support. That's quite a dramatic uh, thing to say. There's no question that we're in an era of strategic transition and we are moving away from what we can comfortably understand as a liberal international order. And we're moving towards something else. And we probably know also that it's not just about strategic accommodation of a rising power, it's about disrupting or even dismantling that order. And we are moving towards something else. And the question is, well, what is that something else going to look like? That's where leadership comes in. Who is going to shape it? Who is going to influence it? How is strategic competition going to create or challenge any new emerging order. So it's within that framework that I'd like to talk to the panelists today. And I think we need to start, Penendra, with the domestic um, political scene. Um, there have been some elections, and I, I'm really interested in hearing from you um, what do you think those elections tell us about where Japanese politics uh, and the electoral cycle uh, is heading? 
What are the outcomes of those elections that you think we ought to take note of? Okay, thanks very much. Um, I just want to open <coughs> with a statement that uh, this year, 2019, has been a very interesting year for Japan in political terms. Because there have been some political events, and they take place once in decades. Uh, one I'm referring to the accession of the new emperor uh, to the throne. Uh, 30 years uh, since Heisei, 1989. So we have got a new emperor this year, right? And 2019 uh, is the year of the boar. And this is especially significant for politics in Japan. Why it is significant for politics in Japan that in this year of the boar, the unified local elections and the upper house elections happen in, in a two months difference time. So this year we had the unified local elections in Japan in April um, and then the upper house elections in July. And going back in 2007, the last year of the board election, the LDP performed, the Liberal Democratic Party, which is the ruling party of Japan, it performed very badly in 2007. And Abe was the prime minister then. Mm. And he went to India uh, in August after the election and gave a very impressive, uh, often quoted um, uh, talk uh, to the Indian parliament called the Confluence of the Two Seas, yes. uh, which is kind of, uh, it turned into Indo-Pacific and free and open Indo-Pacific. But my point is that in 2007, as soon as Abe returned from India, he resigned his position mm -hmm. because of immense pressure on him uh, because of the poor performance of the LDP. So he resigned. Now 2019, uh, let's talk about 2019, completely reverse. Abe is still the prime minister, a uh, second time prime minister in Japan, unified local elections. Uh, the LDP and its uh, partners, they did quite well in the unified local elections. And they did well at the upper house elections because Abe had set a low uh, bar for the LDP and his coalition partner, the Komeito. Uh, so they uh, performed much above what Abe had set as the bar for as to how many seats the LDP should get. So that brings Abe into a stronger position compared to 2007. At the same time, uh, before these upper house elections, the LDP had super majority, as they call it, that is the two thirds majority in both houses of parliament. And that means that if the government wants to propose an amendment in the constitution, they can do that. But in this upper house election, Abe lost his super majority in the upper house. And that, what does that mean? Because I think Abe's dream project, or maybe one of the two dream projects, is to change the constitution. So that dream project of Abe has kind of, um, has gone a bit backward or maybe he may not be able to realize. But he still insists that he would do that. So that, that's the political side of the comment. Uh, but also just a um, little bit, is it okay to, to okay, sure. uh, maybe I will stop there and come back later. Well, no, um, okay. keep going. <laughs> I'm, I'm hoping, well, I'm hoping so, that So what does this in. particular 2019 elections mean? The upper house elections do not attract uh, international media or, uh, you know, uh, even in Australia, we didn't hear much about it. But this is a very important election and this year was very important. And this takes me back to the LDP rule for a very, very long period of time. So in 1989, 
at the time when the Heisei Emperor came to the throne, the LDP was a very weak political party, almost on the verge of losing its uh, majority. But somehow they uh, survived at that time. 1993, we see a coalition, LDP lo losing its majority, a coalition party comes. And since 1993, what we are seeing in Japan is a trend, which is a coalition government in Japan. Right? So if you, so even the LDP has been in coalition with um, the Komeito party for the last about 20 years. So this is quite an interesting trend in Japan. At the same time, we see the LDP being dominant. So the old LDP domination persists but there is a trend for a coalition government. And also the LDP lost power in 2009. Yes, you could also argue that the LDP would love nothing better mm -hmm. than to shake off um, the Cometo. Because yeah. the Cometo is standing in the way of that great um, aspiration uh, that usually attaches mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. Prime Minister Abe of revising the pacifist yes. laws yes. of the Constitution. Um, yeah, well, that's... Uh, but PG, it, it, you know, yes. is the opposition ever going to get its act together? Uh, <laughs> the opposition um, is pretty um, fo much focused on the Constitution. The Constitution is one issue that uh, makes it easy to um, <coughs> confront the other administration in a straightforward manner. This also marginalizes mm. the opposition and as a possible governing, governing party. And that's the dilemma we saw mm. in the Japanese Socialist Party, and we're seeing that this right now with Rike Minshuto. Uh, you're clear on constitution, uh, and that can grab considerable amount, amount of votes. But it's a problem of competence also. That, that is true. Uh, and, and, and that's something that and they've been struggling with right now. And about um, Komeito, that, that's yeah. an excellent point. Um, Abe wants to reverse the constitution, period, really. And it's, it's, that is his priority. Uh, and having said that, um, if you shake off Komeito, I'm not sure if LDP um, members of parliament uh, would be happy because uh, they've become so dependent on um, vote mobilization from, from Soka Gakkai. So uh, yes, Abe doesn't want Komeito um, to to um, shake policy on defense matters. Uh, he certainly disagree, uh, didn't like um, the, the way Komeito handled the Ampo Hose or the security laws. And uh, Komeito, of course, is opposed to the revision of, of the Constitution. Um, but um, at the same time, an LDP without Komeito is going to be pretty tough uh, for um, um, first term, second term uh, members of parliament. So that's a divisive issue. That brings us to Abe, and isn't it true, and even the slides um, that we have uh, behind us uh, for this Japan update, it's all about Abe. And uh, there's a lot written about Abe as a conviction um, nationalist uh, politician, wants to revise the peace clause of the constitution, etc., etc. But um, recently people have been pointing to um, several um, indications that Abe is sacrificing his um, ideology and you might call his um, super ideological convictions for the cause of pragmatism. And I'm going to especially bring that out when I talk to the panel about um, some bilateral relationships at the moment. But the indicator of this is the latest blue book and newspaper articles have been uh, written about this. Um, many things have been written about the great difference between the 2018 Blue Book and the 2019. Because all of a sudden, in 12 months between the Blue Books, the DPRK, Russia and China are referred to in rather nice um, conciliatory and future-focused <laughs> terms. Whereas you cannot say that at all about the way they were referred to in the 2018 uh, version of the Blue Book. And Adam Leaf, Tobias Harris, they're now saying Abe has become a pragmatist. 
and he has reduced his ideological ambition for constitutional revision to getting the self-defence forces recognised in the constitution as a legal entity. Forget about all the rest of Article 9 being changed. and That is what um, he has reduced his ambition to. So to what extent, panellists, do we think that it is all about Abe? And going back to Kiyuchi's presentation, there has been significant institutional change. Is that likely to survive Abe when he moves from the political stage, the National Security Council, the incredibly well-staffed secretariat, the Cabinet Personnel Bureau, the centralisation of foreign and security policy authority and coordination into the Prime Minister's office? Why should that change when Abe leaves the stage, Kiichi? Do you think it will? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the question, sorry, um, the question you raised about yeah. post Abe, mm. which is 2021, we are talking um, about. Right? In theory. In theory, in theory. <laughs> we have to be in he theory. He might do a quadruple Yes, I mean, tomorrow lessons. anything can happen in politics. One week is a long time in politics, as we know. Yeah. But let's think 2021, right? So post Abe, what is the scenario? Who are the people who are going to replace Abe? In Japan, as most of you know, is still a very a strong hereditary politics, yeah. and even within the LDP. So I have counted there are eight names always put forward as post-Abe <coughs> leadership, right? Mm. And all of them are in the old LDP mode. Some might be a little bit more liberal, others might be a little bit more conservative. If you think about Ishiba, he wants to change Article 9, right? Totally, not like Abe. Uh, if you look at um, uh, other politicians in the LDP, they might have a little bit liberal ideas. But there is no renewal of policy ideas, in my view, right? So all these politicians have been in the LDP for such a long period of time, and they have been with Abe for such a long period of time. And we are now hearing younger generation of LDP politicians, right? So everyone is talking about Shinjiro uh, Koizu. And even there's a talk that he might be in the next Abe cabinet, he is going to reshuffle soon. So my question is whether we have got renewal in Japanese politics. And I can't see that. Within, yeah. yeah, who needs renewal when you're on the winner? But that's what you do. I mean, yes. You're winning. Yes. But you keep so, on doing the same old thing, right? Yeah, it works. So if it works, it works. Um, well, coming back to this, an Abe, an ideological or pragmatist hmm. question. Um, Abe has been quite pragmatic um, in his second administration for the simple reason being that he wants to stay in power. And there's a, a remarkable difference between um, the first administration and the second administration. But nonetheless, there was a, a consistency um, in taking China as the main threat. Mm. And that uh, was common to both Abe 1 and Abe 2. Mm -hmm. And in Abe 2, since 2018, the, the point you discussed uh, about this um, blue book um, is a significant change. Mm. And also, where well, North Korea, North Korea seems to be dangerous when the, Amer uh, when the American president thinks it's dangerous. Uh, when, uh, <laughs> when North Korea uh, is not willing to work on uh, long-range missiles and that endanger um, US security, then somehow Japan seems to be happy with short-range missile that can reach Japan with nuclear warheads. So um, <laughs> I don't want to be cynical, <laughs> but it's, it's, uh, it's quite uh, difficult to, be, to take all these seriously, really. Um, it is so hard to take it seriously. Yes. And yet there's this um, pragmatic line oh, yes. radiating yes. Out, of, out of the blue book. Yes. And although I would say that when it comes to um, um, his ideologies, um, I, I would think that he, um, um, Prime Minister Abe still remains um, 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 uh, a right-wing politician, especially when it comes to the definition um, of the um, Japanese nation after the Second World War. And, and that um, has been under control in a way, because uh, you um, visit the Yasukuni and you, you're out, really. 
um, and, um, and or and if uh, you um, um, start um, something that rocks on the history issue with China, mm. uh, that would challenge um, the legitimacy of the administration. However, um, observing the development of this dispute between ROK and, and Japan, I think I can say that uh, this is still very much a nationalistic administration. It, it is a nationalistic administration, mm. but let's look at some mm. counterexamples straight away. Bumi, we okay. heard from Kiichi's own mouth um, just a few minutes ago that things are going the right way with the Japan-China relations, okay. uh, especially from 2018. Mm -hmm. Now, Kiichi was suggesting this is ad hocery, it's not going to last. But can we contemplate that perhaps by moving in a more positive direction in its relationship with China, that Abe is, and Japan is creating some strategic space or distance even between Japan and the US mm -hmm. as far as the China policy is concerned. What do you think? Okay, so uh, China-Japan relations has received a lot of attention and many people get the uh, impression that uh, China-Japan relations is improving. But my question is, so in what field or at what front that Sino-Japan relations have pro improved? So the two, the bilateral relations have been tightening since I would say 2014 when the first uh, Xi Jinping Abe summit was held at APEC. And then there are, well, they met with each other constantly. And uh, the Japanese government has promised to cooperate with BRI. So, but I would say that the improving relations between the two countries is really very symbolic. The only achievement coming out of this kind of uh, improving political climate is they have working on the mechanism averting unintended military clash, uh, clashes between their forces in and above near water. That's, I think that's the only achievement. And, but because if you look at the, how do you say, the public opinion toward yes. China, mm -hmm. so constantly over 80% of Japanese people, they say they don't have affinity to, with China. And if you look at the Senkaku Diaoyu Island issue, so the Chinese uh, coastal armies constantly entered the, uh, near the Senkaku Diaoyu Island. So the, these kind of things has all, have always been there. And the tension over like political, uh, the <coughs> economic and over, uh, political tensions have not been eased, right. first of all. And then about economic cooperation, well, the Japanese government has promised to work with uh, BRI, but only on a case-by-case -case basis, right? So, and they qualified, qualified mm. with four preconditions. Okay. Yeah. So, currently, there is no one single project being cooperated by the two governments under the umbrella of BRI. Are you willing to say, however grudgingly, that things are going in a more positive direction? Yeah, maybe if without the trade war okay. between China and the United States. Okay. But we have the trade war, so what does this mean? Isn't Japan going to be squeezed by the US to also embrace a harder line towards China in the trade sphere? Well, I think the several things we need to look very carefully. First of all, the US-Japan trade negotiation. 
and whether the, the, in the agreement will include the same clause like uh, Mexico, Canada, US agreement. Uh, which was target was being said that it's targeted mm. against China, and second, whether uh, the U.S. is how to say they they determined to to, to decouple yes the, the the economic relations with China or not because well uh, the uh, Japan's uh, the Japanese government has adopted kind of engagement policy with China. Well they can well they adopt the containment policy against China in the security arena, but yeah. on the other hand, it promote like using the government words, that's the functional economic uh, cooperation mm -hmm. with China. But if the, this kind of decoupling things go on, then it's really difficult for Japan to cooperate or continue this, con this kind of engagement policy toward China. Okay. And that, that kind of the US policy will actually shape the future direction of Sino-Japan relations. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to cling to my line about pragmatism being evident. And, and Lauren, I, I just want to ask you about DPRK at this moment, because We'll come back to the ROK later. I don't think that's an example of pragmatism. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but when we look at the DPRK, mm -hmm. and, and Kiichi, you might um, chip in here as well. Abe and Japan has been utterly marginalised in all of the recent DPRK mm -hmm. diplomacy. Mm -hmm. If Trump mentioned the words abductees during one of his meetings with Kim, mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure how big a success uh, we can call that. So do you think we're going to see some independent Abe diplomacy? Is he going to get his own bilateral uh, with Kim? What's going on there? Yeah, I, th I think it's very unlikely. Um, I would have to agree with um, Kichi and also Tobias Harris um, in his East Asia um, Forum quarterly piece where he says that, you know, Abe has often um, sacrificed you know, his foreign policy goals and other goals um, for the sake of maintaining his power base. And yeah. I think that's the best way to understand his treatment of the DPRK because I think Abe knows that if he was to take a chance on the DPRK and say, OK, let's have a summit, a denuclearization summit, Abe has to bring up the abduction issue. And he has to get something back from Kim on the abduction issue or he'll suffer domestically. Mm -hmm. And he mm -hmm. knows that <coughs> what can Kim give him on the abduction issue? All he's well, going to say is that... about they're... something in Japan's national interest? Yeah. <laughs> how, how about, honestly, um, yeah. is, here we, we have an example of security mm -hmm. uh, being outgunned by um, domestic popularity. Yeah, it's, it's quite astounding that, you know, Japan, especially under the Abe administration, has always put the abduction issue before the nuclear issue. Mm. Even though the abduction issue is essentially a historical issue. I mean, yes. OK, maybe some of them are still alive. Um, but the nuclear issue is, is a current issue. And Japan, having been victim of atomic bombs before, should know better than any other country what a serious threat that is and to really put that at the forefront. So that again just speaks to, I think, how much he just wants to stay in power and appease his domestic constituencies. At any cost. At any cost. Okay, yeah. we've gone away from pragmatism, so I'm clinging to it here now, Kiichi. Yep. Um, Japan, US. We've heard about the bromance between Abe and Trump. There's a question of dividend versus detriment. There's an incredible list of detriment. Mm -hmm. First of all, being marginalised from DPRK diplomacy. There's TPP. Abe is, is, is leading, America is out. There's the Paris Accord. There's the tariffs and the threat of harsh terms on the next round of host nation support yes. negotiations. Uh, the list is actually longer than that, but let's stop there for the detrimental aspects. Apart from the domestic political cachet of being a mate of Trump's, what has Abe got to show 
for actually going a long way to, to demean himself and subordinate himself um, in this romance. Um, Ricky, you're pushing me into a position to defend others. <laughs> you're asking the wrong person, really. Uh, uh, but nonetheless, I, I think it's fair to say that um, a, a list of um, um, difficulties, if not crisis, uh -huh. in foreign policy of failures um, has, not, um, has not worked against others' popularity. No. No. Uh, oh, it's a puzzle, really. Mm -hmm. And I really don't have uh, good answers to that. Um, um, in one way, um, this is a prime minister who is successful in showing his face overseas, mm -hmm. um, giving good um, talks. Um, uh, and he does uh, deliver um, pretty well uh, in Washington, or Canberra, um, or London. I've heard him once um, in London. He did, did it pretty well. Um, but um, that uh, has little to do with actual policy achievements. Um, what you can say is that uh, without the bromance, the US could have been much harsher, much more troublesome to Japan. So Abe has worked in a way to somehow contain the Trump crisis. And that would be the mainline argument that you would hear from Kasumi Gaseki. What would have happened? If um, Abe worked um, in a way like um, uh, like um, like a Merkel um, or Trump, Macron, or Macron, and then we have a uh, crisis, major crisis. Um, that doesn't mean that um, well, we have been successful in winning a policy that we wish from the United States at all. And you know, isn't there still a prospect of tariffs being imposed on Japanese oh, yes, cars? Oh, yes. Will that be the point where domestic credibility is stretched? I doubt it. Um, you doubt it. I doubt it. You, you uh, as a matter of fact, no. Uh, th this is an interesting point. Uh, take a look at the trade um, policy uh, reaction to um, trade policy in the United States, and you see support for trade regulations and tariff um, among the Democrats as well. Mm -hmm. And the support for, well, if I may say, protectionist measures um, is actually um, quite bipartisan. So uh, the move away from liberal internationalism right. is actually going to its opposite. And, uh, this is not a place to discuss about this, but um, <laughs> this is my fear that liberal, liberal internationalism always had um, um, a democracy deficit. This was more about, uh, well, um, intellectuals, uh, liberals, elites, um, but uh, with um, limited support from domestic public opinion. Middle of the road, elitist, this position is now being discredited. Uh, discredited, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is something I see. Um, uh, when it comes to unprofessionalism in other foreign policy, I have very strong words. Um, I, I use very strong words. But that has not attracted much attention from Japan. Japanese media at all, really. Yeah. And I feel like I'm talking like a bureaucrat. <laughs> no, 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 you're, no, you're no. all right, Keiichi. Well, you're, you. you're okay. Uh, but, uh, but somehow, um, this relationship between um, um, support from the civil society for a more liberal international institution, this nexus might be weaker than we right. assumed. Um, yeah, there's a lot of um, hums and, and nods uh, with you, Kiji. I think the pragmatism idea is being shot down, and Adam Liff is going to have to retract a couple of his recent articles where he argues this, and we'll have to get on to Tobias about his article, mm. in, <laughs> because really, the, we haven't found evidence yet for the pragmatism direction behind Abe, um, the Abe administration's foreign and, and security policy. And yeah, I was going to juxtapose at this point and say that we have one glaring exception of a departure from pragmatism, being Japan are okay, Lauren. Now we have harsh words, including from you, um, in, in your article, where you say, there is no clear way out of this impasse, your words. John um, Nelson Wright, something seems to have snapped. 
yep. between Japan and, and the RIK. Now, um, this is feeling very serious. It feels like national identity politics mm -hmm. coming out of um, every nook and cranny in both countries. What is driving it? Can you shed some light on it for us? How much time have we got? <laughs> <laughs> That's one hour. Um, yeah, so obviously there's no pragmatism here on either side. I think it, it's very clear that there's no winners in this dispute. Both countries are going to suffer a lot economically, security-wise, diplomacy-wise. Um, the relationship's taken a real hit. Um, so I don't want to discuss, you know, the, all these current disputes you see going on because you can, I'm sure you've all heard about them, the trade wars and court cases and, and things like that. Um, but I would like to say that I think in understanding what's going on, we can't find a solution, we can't find the cause by looking at the current disputes. I would say that all of these disputes are just an effect of a much deeper struggle, and this is where the cause lies. I think the reason we have so much trouble understanding Japan ROK relations, um, especially the history problems in the post-Cold War period, how they've played out, is because we have the level of analysis wrong. And I think it's, it's not, I don't see it as identity disputes or really national disputes. I think we can't understand these d disputes as a Japan versus Korea problem or in like a national um, framework. Um, from all the field work I've done on these issues, um, especially concerning Korean victims, and they're the ones, the comfort women, the forced laborers, they're, they're the ones really at the forefront of what's going on here. And really these disputes can only be understood as a struggle uh, between the individual and the state. And when I say the state, I'm not talking about Japan versus them, I'm talking about the Japanese and Korean government versus the Korean victims and many left-wing activists in Japan who've been supporting them in their struggle for decades. And this struggle obviously stems from the fact that the two governments, uh, a lot of Koreans suffered under colonialism terribly, um, especially these categories of victims that we see dominating today, and also the Korean atomic bomb victims who don't really get a voice, um, and that's a whole other story. But, you know, the two governments tried to resolve their problems in 1965. They signed a treaty, waived all of their rights. Um, the problem was that these victims didn't support that treaty. They didn't support that settlement. Well, they weren't consulted. Exactly. Um, so they had no choice. The only category of victim that was negotiated specifically was the forced laborers. And I think this is partly why Japan's so emotional today. You know, we, we solved that issue <laughs> with you. Mm -hmm. Now you're just throwing that up in the air. Um, but the problem was many analysts are drawing, you know, this treaty as the source of today's problems. But I would say that's the foundation. But the actual source is really South Korea's democratization in the late 1980s. That's when everything changed. That's when these victims could rise up and they were supported by many Japanese left-wing activists. And that's when this struggle began that we see culminating today. First, they tried to sue Japan in Japanese courts. Didn't work. Then they tried to sue Japan and Japanese companies in US courts. Didn't work. <coughs> then they came to Korea, sued Japan through Korean courts. Finally, the Korean judiciary is realizing, you know, international law does not empower, you know, citizens of one country to challenge a government of another country. There's, there's no laws um, that allow for that. Treaties are designed to facilitate relations between states. So this is their last chance. We need to empower them. We're going to do that um, by supporting them in the court ruling. And, you know, the reason I say it's been individual versus state is because every time I visited the offices of these victims and their advocates, including their advocates in Japan, I always found they're not just angry at the Japanese government, they're angry at the South Korean government um, for not supporting them in their um, you know, pursuit of compensation from Japan. And so they've attacked both governments for decades. And Moon, um, President <coughs> Moon, is the first president since that treaty was signed that has totally aligned his position with the victim's position. And because he's done that, um, up until then, all of the Korean governments, yes, they would push Tokyo, say, we need an apology, we need some money, but they respected the treaty. They said, let's work around it. Let's find solutions around it. 
Um, because Moon has changed the diplomatic status quo, he's really angered Japan. And because he changed the diplomatic status quo, Japan responded by saying, we're going to change the economic status quo. That's your punishment. <laughs> And then I don't think they expected Korea to then retaliate against that and say, well, we don't trust you anymore, so we're going to change the security status quo of our relationship. We're not going to share intelligence with you. So is this yeah. just state exhibi exhibitionism towards their own citizenry, mm -hmm. demonstrating a changed dynamic between state and individual? Is that what you're saying? I think so. And a lot of people like to look at Japan and South Korea as this very unique, you know, fascinating relationship where they should get along, but they don't. Um, and they're bizarre in that sense. They have common threats, this and that. But what we overlook is there's this similarities. This same struggle has been going on with another <coughs> big perpetrator in World War II, Germany. Exactly the same scenario um, in 2000 and 2008. The Greek and Italian uh, victims of Nazi crimes who never got compensated under Germany's um, you know, post-war settlements, they sued Germany through their own domestic courts. And they won. You know? And it sent the relationship in a downward spiral. And exactly the same effect. Germany said, we're not paying you the money, just like Japan said to the companies in Japan, don't pay these laborers the money. And as a result, Greece and Italy said, well, we're going to freeze your assets exactly what's happening um, in Japan today. We're going to liquidate the Goethe Institute assets and you're going to have to pay. And the relationship hit rock bottom. The media was saying the same thing, you know. The, this is the worst the relationship's been since 1945. So there, there is a big struggle going on. Some people are calling it a rights revolution where, you know, there is a recognition among, you know, judiciaries around the world that, yeah, that there is a major legal loophole where, you know, these victims from the war, and there were so many victims from World War II, they, they can't, you know, sue a foreign state. And they, because of all these post-war settlements that were decided by states. So the courts are trying to challenge that and say that individual yeah. and the state are separate legal entities. Yeah. And you never had the right to make that deal. So therefore, it's null and void. And that's revolutionary. And that's manifesting is a great deal of friction. So what we see is um, pragmatism is only superficial and what's actually going on underneath is business as usual. Yep. But beneath what seems like lunacy when you look at, a, at it from a national interest point of view. Oh, absolutely. And from a security yeah. point of view. Yeah. And a responsibility to protect point of view. Mm -hmm. um, there's actually some substance beneath that. Yeah. That is not crazy. Yeah, yes. that's true. I no, guess I'm reducing your argument. Yeah, but I think <laughs> you're right. Like, everyone probably thinks, you know, this is crazy. And it was actually the hypothesis when I started my PhD. My hypothesis was these victims are trying to get a control of the diplomatic relationship because they want it settled on their terms. And then, to my surprise, when I attended meetings of Korean forced laborers in Tokyo, it was all Japanese people fighting for justice. It was actually written on their, you know, their paper. We want to control the diplomatic handling of this problem. Mm. Finally, they found their leverage. For the comfort women, the leverage is building statues in front of embassies. For the laborers, it's seizing assets in Korea. What the about company. the, the atomic bomb victims? Yeah, they've, they've had a much harder time. Um, in a sense, they had an easier time because Japanese atomic bomb victims got paid by the Japanese government. So the Japanese government set a legal precedent it had to apply to those Not victims. Not all of them, though. Not all of mm -hmm. them. Um, but what I argue is that it's the US alliance with Japan and South Korea that suppressed this issue. Because the US is implicated in this and doesn't want this issue coming out, and the two governments don't want to upset the US. So they've had a much harder um, time mm. getting um, their voice out, I think. <laughs> Kiji brings us back to the US again, right? Mm. So at what point, if, if at any stage, is the US um, expected or able to intervene in, in what ought to be an issue of concern to them because it impacts on their um, basing mm -hmm. and their security strategy mm. for the region? Japan's relationship with South Korea was always um, an, an issue for U.S. security policy, because, and after all, uh, the two nations are allies mm. of the United States. 
And um, there was always this possibility of building a um, strong relationship between Japan and South Korea um, on defense so that um, the defense structure would be more multilateral in nature. We already have a minilateral, as we call it, um, between Australia and Japan. Uh, so that make, makes a triangle here, mm. uh, US, Japan, Australia. Uh, uh, from the narrow-minded viewpoint of security strategists and building strong relationship between ROK and Japan was critical. And uh, sharing defense information was not really uh, Tokyo's idea. Mm -hmm. uh, this was uh, Washington, because uh, they wanted closer cooperation uh, between ROK and Japan. Um, the, the agreement was actually symbolic, because um, most of the information was, was supposed to come from Korea, mm -hmm. and they did not give much information anyway. Um, and so, um, so, so the um, in, the defense information or intelligence information matter um, um, is not about um, a fully functioning regime, but nonetheless, this was critical for the United States, um, so that they can build strong relationship between South Korea and Japan. Um, it was never popular in South Korea. <coughs> Mm -hmm. And, and uh, well, right now, as you can see, um, uh, the opposition to um, President Park is now the ruling um, um, party. Uh, so you can easily see why they are dropping that idea. Um, however, we're talking about Trump here, right? I know. Yes. Uh, uh, this, was, uh, this is the Trump administration um, that, is, um, that is willing to um, push um, China on the one hand and still impose a um, tariff on Japan. On Japan, right? and, yes. and linking trade with security, yes. which is something mm -hmm. quite recent. So, um, and so this would weaken the alliance in, uh, on, <clears throat> on, one hand, on the one hand, and, and also uh, lead to a more unilateral behavior from the United States on the other. Uh, just to repeat the point I've made about North Korea, um, the Trump administration, well, at least Mr. Trump, seems to believe that North Korea is no longer a threat. And although uh, we believe um, that, well, um, um, from the advices of my, uh, my respected friend Jeffrey Lewis, um, the short-range missiles are capable of nuclear warheads. Yeah. Right. Um, it's not a matter of when. It has happened already, um, which is a larger threat than it used to be. So, you know, the credibility mm. of what it means to have an alliance with mm. the United States is actually what's in play here. Yes. Um, if you cannot rely um, on fundamental understanding of core mm. national interest issues from the United States as an ally of the United States, then where do you have to turn? And mm. yes, yes, really. maybe you can turn to China. Yeah, <laughs> yeah no, I'm not kidding. That's, that's what they call hedging. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. well, because well, actually China is playing a very interesting role uh, well, amid this uh, well, rift between South Korea and Japan. And China was mediating, right? Yes, mm -hmm. China is There's mediating the two countries. Yeah, incredible. But, yeah. Mm. But not, <laughs> but not, not as, as an, an ally. ally. Which is better. Not as an ally, yeah. 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 Of course, China, yeah. Yes. Okay. China is not happy about the defense information sharing system, but what <coughs> China wants is the RCEP, which China wants the RCEP to be concluded this year. Mm -hmm. and, and also China wants the China, South Korea, and Japan trilateral FTAs to be concluded soon, and because of the US-China trade war. And so this rift between the, uh, South Korea and Jap Japan has also actually undermined China's well, strategic influence. Uh, so that is why China is mediating between the two countries. So that's kind of very interesting, and we, that, th that kind of things and that would be an incredible feat of pragmatism, she said, heroically returning to her theme. <laughs> if Japan could swallow its pride and accept China's role as an intermediary, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying it's going to happen. Yeah, I'll 
Freaky. Oh. <laughs> I'm not living in total fantasy. Freaky. But, yes. It ain't going to happen. I know, I know. Yeah. I know. I mean, it would be lovely if it, uh, if it happens. But, um, it would be uh, pragmatic. But each government is speaking to a core supporter, a core audience, mm -hmm. which is pretty extreme on mm -hmm. policy positions. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, if this is a two-level game, uh, there's no win set. Really. Yeah, so yeah. this foreign policy you're saying is based in domestic politics yes. to a certain extent. Yes. And that brings me to this point that uh, whether we love or hate Abe, uh, he is going to be, he, he remains in his position until 2021, barring what yes. you said. Mm. Uh, but there is a, uh, prospect that he might get another term because That's right. uh, some LDP leaders have been talking about it. Uh, and if you look at uh, Abe's popularity, it's not very high, but high enough. It's, it's in relation to the opposition. Uh, Abe's popularity is in his 40s or late 30s, 40s. Uh, the next um, party uh, in, in the Japanese parliament, Constitutional Democratic Party, their popularity is in single digit, right? So whether we like or we don't like it, it seems to me that Abe is going to be in this position. So everyone else has to negotiate uh, with Abe, uh, just like Xi Jinping, uh, you know, life president for life. I mean, Abe has been in this position for already seven years and it's likely another two years plus another three years. So that's a long time for any leader. But then, then let's see, is, is there a prospect of any kind of Japanese um, foreign policy or security leadership in this current strategic environment? And Penendra, I'm particularly thinking of yeah. Um, Japan-India diplomacy, yes. which has been yeah. remarkable. It's quite interesting, in actually. Years. And we have the free and open Indo-Pacific yes no longer called a strategy, mm. uh, <laughs> now it's called a concept, which a is vision. slightly worrying, or a vision, vision. Um, or a thing. Mm. Um, I mean, it's quite, but, yeah, um, thanks for it. Yeah, this yeah, is an example of an point. attempt to stimulate yeah. and shape multilateralism, yes. Yes. whether it's exclusively to counterbalance China's global influence mm. or not, I think yeah. um, doesn't um, undermine this yes. idea that here we see Japan at least engaging in a kind of thought leadership mm. when it comes to multilateralism. I mean, look. I uh, wondered on what yeah. everyone. Abe on the is extremely thinks. popular in India, mm. and the current <laughs> extremely popular in India. Somewhere, that's uh, and uh, Abe and Modi, the current prime minister. You might have seen not just embracing, actually hugging each other. <laughs> and um, uh, you know, uh, Abe was taken to Modi's electoral constituency in Varanasi, where he was seen doing, you know, uh, worshiping the Hindu gods there. He was asked to come to Modi's hometown, and similarly, you know, Abe hosted uh, Modi in his uh, villa in Yamanashi. So also, in Southeast Asian countries, the whole idea of Indo-Pacific has been embraced now, and Abe remains quite uh, popular in most of the Southeast and Asian countries. And they share the, the, the share that vision, yes, including Australia, in, I mean. Including Africa. Including Africa. I mean, we can talk about TCAT 7, which happened last week. We can talk week. about, yeah, but, but yeah. Uh, however, I just want to clarify with my gatekeepers in the front row. Yeah. Do we have 10 minutes more for Q&A? Because oh, I've been yes. operating okay. on that principle. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yes. Okay. Um, I so, end there. yeah, any final words on uh, free and open Indo-Pacific as Japan leading? Well, the point is the US has now embraced this idea. Right, so the whole to Western limited extent. Well, the whole Western Pacific Command is now known as Indo-Pacific. Indo Indo-Pacific, but right? Africa is nowhere near it. In, no, that, in that's USA. true. But in Southeast Asia, in Australia, you know, we have been also advocating this idea We're of Indo. We're on Indo the bandwagon. One, yeah. one final word: when we talk about multilateralism or, in, uh, or international cooperation, each participating nation should limit the exertion of power. <coughs> the self-limit of power is essential uh, for uh, construction, construction of institution. And this is something we, that is conspicuously absent mm -hmm. in Japan-India relations, or for that matter, um, China's role uh, as a mediator.
We see negotiation, mm. but we do not see well discipline that is required. Self constrained. For a yes. So Self you don't see any significance in free and open Indo Pacific not yet. vision replacing strategy? No. I, don't see I know that. it's a reach. Okay, I'm giving up on pragmatism now, and I'm throwing the floor open to Q&A. Yes, in the front row here. Thanks uh, very much, Madam Chair. Can we go back to some pre-pragmatic panel discussion uh, you where you were try. talking about Article 9 of the Constitution? Um, even last year, before the elections, uh, Prime Minister Abe seemed to be courting the Cometo in terms of changing Article 9 in that he was going to allow a third clause, which Cometo seemed to want, rather than changing Clause 2, which speaks about the legitimacy of the STF. Now, you did say that he might have achieved the minor goal, and that is getting the uh, SCF accepted as a legal uh, entity. But there are those who do say that it hasn't gone far enough. In other words, with the support of the Cometo in this current parliament, could he get the 70%? The 70 and if he can, is he likely to get the 50% of the populace behind him to change Article 9? Uh, I'd love to hear I'll the panel's views. Along the panel, Keiji. Mm -hmm. um, unlikely. <coughs> Uh, yeah. uh, to, to put it very simply, unlikely. Um, uh, Cometo would be uh, still, still strongly opposed to changing the substance of Article 9. Uh, and, and that is, of course, the center of the revision of the Constitution. Um, and um, an LDP without Cometo uh, is a political risk for too many uh, members of parliament. So um, the outcome would be quite limited. Now, Abe is going to push a limit. Um, um, if he is successful in the next lower house election. Oh, he's having a cabinet reshuffle too. Uh, with the cabinet reshuffle with Mogi, um, possibly as a foreign minister, um, might change things a bit. But nonetheless, I am pretty skeptical about the outcome. Rumi? Yeah, yeah, well, I, I totally agree with Keith. Okay. Laura? Yeah, I think part of the problem with the proposed amendments to Article 9 is that the lack of conceptual clarity. It's not just because people, you know, are still sticking with pacifism, but yeah, there's, there seems to be a lot of dispute about <coughs> what it should entail. Well, uh, apart from Article 9, there are other articles uh, which are being considered for, for revision and, uh, and amendment. Uh, but the point is, Abe has lost two-thirds majority in the upper house. So that's the first point uh, where he cannot move forward. Um, and I agree with Keiichi in, in terms of Cometo. Certainly, they are dead against this idea. I have uh, talking, talked to the leader of the Cometo party several times. And he has made it very clear that they don't agree. The other thing is, if you look at the public opinion polls in Japan about cons the Constitution, uh, it's still we, you don't get majority there. So there is this <coughs> there is big split: people who support the idea of constitutional amendment and people who don't support. So the people who don't support still have got the majority over people who do support. Okay, there seems to be consensus here, Peter. Other questions? There's one at the back there. <coughs> and then one there. Yep. Hi, I'm Michael, first year international security here at ANU. Um, within Australia, in light of a rising China, a potentially withdrawing US, and a joker card that is North Korea, there's been discussion of Australia potentially getting nuclear weapons. Is there a similar discourse within Japan about getting nuclear weapons, and what's your personal stance on that? Uh, who would like Japan to Japan going it? nuclear? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, um, <laughs> there has been um, 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 politicians who have made um, their observation about that, include, uh, including Ishihara Shintaro, uh, who used to be the mayor uh, of uh, Tokyo, a uh, governor of Tokyo. Uh, but no, essentially no. However, it's now um, being discussed in various public media, whereas before it was unthinkable. The other point is the US-Japan relationship is uh, Japan has got the nuclear umbrella, right? And if Japan goes nuclear, the whole rationale behind US-Japan relationship is under attack. 
So I don't think the US would like Japan to go nuclear. That's my take on that issue. Yeah, I, I think a lot of this discussion, you know, is sort of based on an assumption that maybe the US is withdrawing from the region, maybe one day there will be no alliance. But yeah, I, I see Trump as, as an aberration. I mean, if you look at the alliance on an operational level, it's extremely strong and an institutional level, I think, yeah. For, and it's increasing yeah. in terms of exactly. joint exercises, mm. etc. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Well, I don't think uh, uh, Japan will go nuclear because the public sentiment, mm. this the anti-nuclear energy uh, against this kind of nuclear weapons. So I don't think, well, in the near future or in the long term, Japan will go nuclear. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm uh, Yasuki Dodo from Waseda University. I'd like to take uh, this uh, great op opportunity to ask uh, a very naive question to uh, Professor Fujiwara. Uh, uh, you mentioned that uh, uh, liberal internationalism has shrunk. I'm also very much concerned about it. And I think uh, 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 people who actually got uh, get uh, uh, benefits uh, from globalization are uh, against globalization. And uh, so, uh, 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 so, uh, could you tell us uh, how we could, uh, uh, how uh, we could uh, stop it? Uh, for example, uh, education, would education or promoting social interactions uh, uh, help uh, to decrease uh, this uh, tendency? Mm -hmm. um, in <coughs> Th that's the question I want to answer in my next <laughs> book, uh, um, based on a, a series uh, titled Bunkai Suru Sekai or The World uh, in Desari. Um, and I haven't finished the final chapter, um, but um, that is the key question. Um, um, realistically speaking, the origin of internationalism is in many ways uh, based on the fear of, uh, of um, cross-national challenges. Could be disasters, uh, could be um, major wars. Um, say, after the First World War, um, the European, <laughs> European powers, at least, um, had to agree um, to restrain their conduct, um, the use of force in foreign policy. That was a utopian vision, vision that became a reality after the war. Uh, when it comes to international market, um, the uh, paradox of the oil crisis was that after the oil crisis, we see far more cooperation between major economic powers in the management of global market, for the simple reason being uh, that the cross-national um, disaster in the market um, brings suf uh, suffering to all. Now, if there is a global issue that is widely recognized across borders, it's not about trade day, it's not about Trump, it's not about populism, it's not about migration, it's about global climate change. And I do support um, um, the movement um, for um, against global climate change. Um, and that's one of the um, projects that is being done in my center. Um, but nonetheless, uh, this also means that we are not really addressing other issues. Mm. The demands of liberal internationalism in economic institutions, and the, um, the, um, the listening of uh, alliance had a way to control the use of power of um, the United States. Um, so alliance was not simply saying yes to the United States. This was also a framework that puts U.S. power in a way that, uh, that um, other allies can find that them to be agreeable. To that extent, it, was, uh, it had a multilateral ca character. Um, that is being destroyed right now. All these are common issues that are not addressed or shared by the public and frankly, not likely to be in the future. So um, the global climate change is an issue that be, is being recognized across borders, but there are other issues that is not uh, really, um, the threat perception is not really shared, really. And without a shared threat perception, it is very difficult <coughs> to revive on inst on institutions. We are exactly on time. <laughs> and I want to ask you to join me in thanking our marvellous panellists. Thank you.